Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our uh, talk series called Conversation with Women Role Models in STEM. Uh, this is a part of the Vigyan program, which is a scholarship and mentor is a scholarship and mentorship program exclusively for women in Maharashtra. Through this program, we hope to support women, especially coming from underprivileged sections of the society. Um, Vigyan is an initiative by the Pune Knowledge Cluster, which aims to bring forward the journey of women in various fields of science and technology and engineering and mathematics. Uh, and this series specifically is a part of that. Uh, it is conducted in an informal conversation format to help the audience relate to the lives of successful women professionals in science and technology space, knowing firsthand about their success stories, their failures, and how they moved ahead to make a mark in their field. We hope this initiative will inspire young women to break gender stereotypes societal barriers and encourage them to pursue careers in STEM. This program is sponsored by BASF and it's implemented by PKC. And this is the second year of its implementation. Every month we invite prominent women in the science and technology space. And our guest today is Dr. Rohini Gupta, who is the innovation manager from uh, BASF, CARA, that is California Research Alliance. And I would like to introduce her now. She graduated with honors in chemical engineering from Malvia National Institute of Technology, Jaipur. Later, she went to the Johns Hopkins University for her doctoral research. Then she moved for her postdoctoral fellowship to the University of Pennsylvania and worked briefly with Dow Chemical Company. In the recent past, she has been working in the fast-paced semiconductor industry space. Before joining BASF, she was a process technology development engineer for Intel Corporation, and she has worked as a scientist for BASF Corporation's Center for Excellence Semiconductor Applications. Currently, she drives transformation of chemical industry through corporate innovation for sustainability at BASF. She has a prolific publication record in reputed international journals and has received numerous awards for her outstanding technical contribution. Through her community outreach and mentorship efforts, she empowers women in STEM to break barriers. Her talk today is titled, Vision to Victory, Exerting Influence Without Authority. With this, I extend a warm welcome to Rohini and invite her to take over the session. Just a brief mention, we will have 30 minutes of talk and it will be followed by uh, a Q&A session with Dr. Priya Nagraj, who is our CEO. And then the session will be open to the audience for um, question answers. Please post your questions in the chat box. And uh, I think over to you, uh, Rohini, now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ritika. Um, just a quick check. Do you see a bar in uh, on the top of my slides or is it all visible? Yeah, it's visible. OK, perfect. Excellent. Uh, so thank you, Ritika. Uh, thank you, PKC, for the kind invitation to speak with the audience today regarding my journey. Uh, before I start, um, a big shout out to all the women leaders at PKC. I think what you guys do is absolutely amazing and inspiring. And my recommendation to all the Vidnyan scholars would be to talk to each one of these ladies and hear their journeys. And I guarantee you, theirs is every bit as inspiring as any of the speakers they may invite formally on this platform to speak. So with that, let me first talk about uh, Vidnyan. And I will never get this opportunity again. So I'll, I'll take a, a minute break here to talk about how much I absolutely love the logo, right? And who's ever designed it, they've done it wonderfully. So if you look at it, you have the women brain meeting our hearts, our mind meeting our heart. The we that we are together, for women in education, Nyan, knowledge, with Nyan, science. And of course, there is a pen that's mightier than the sword there. So it's absolutely beautiful logo. And I think everything that you women leaders have done um, with PKC and specifically with, with Nyan has been truly inspiring. So with that, I thank you all for your time and your attention as I talk you through my journey a little bit. As Ritika mentioned, today I'll talk about my journey and the spirit has been 
how we go from vision to victory and exert influence without authority as women pioneers in each of our STEM fields. Um, as most of us in this room, I started with humble beginnings. I was born and raised in a middle-class environment in India. I was raised in Jaipur, Rajasthan, uh, which meant that we had everything you would need, but nothing that you would want, which, and what was absolutely needed was education. And we can all agree that our generation has truly benefited from our previous generation and the previous generation. So my grandmothers, they were illiterate, but they were very insistent on my mother, my aunts on both sides to make sure they all pursue their education, at least up until their undergrad, if not masters. And I've truly benefited from that because for me, seeing my mother balance three kids living by herself in, a, in Jaipur, uh, while being a professor in chemistry at University of Rajasthan and my dad being in military engineering services was always away from Jaipur, right? So um, it was truly inspiring to see her balance all of that and yet push us and inspire us to, to put a lot of emphasis on our education and truly be empowered to drive what we wanted to achieve with our careers. And with that, um, I did my undergrad in chemical engineering from NIT Jaipur. Um, after that, it was, I, during my PhD, I realized, uh, during my undergrad, I realized that first of all, mother chemi chemistry professor, father electrical engineer, I like neither. Um, chemical engineering was truly inspiring because it was rooted in math and that was my desire. And I pursued that as an undergrad. During my internship experience at IIC Bangalore, I realized that to be truly at the table to dictate and drive the conversation, you need to have technical expertise. You need to know what you're talking about. You need to have the confidence. And with that in mind, I applied uh, for PhD programs across the world, just like we all have, have done. And I was lucky enough to be um, <clears throat> selected for Johns Hopkins University's chemical and biomolecular engineering program. This is truly where I figured out who I am, not just as a scientist, but also as a person, as an independent woman, trying to make a mark for myself in the world. I also met my husband there. So that was the highlight. We did get married in, in the year 2013 after finishing our PhDs and we started our postdoc journeys in different cities. I started at University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia and he started at MIT in Boston and we continued to be partners in crime, so to speak, uh, yet pursuing our independent careers. Um, amidst all of this was the uh, challenge or the hurdle to go through US or American immigration process to go from your student visa, op uh, OPT, going into a work visa. And amongst all of this was a very interesting year, 2015, where we figured out our visas and we figured out our green cards. And um, I started at the Dow Chemical Company while my husband started at Intel Corporation. And they, if, you were, if I were to give you an idea, they are pretty much um, on the other side, there's a three hour time difference between the two places and uh, that continued our journey for being in different cities while we continue to be partners in crime. And as we progress to our next, uh, next chapter in our life together was family planning. And um, it turned out that we needed medical intervention and a key piece to that was being in the same town. And that's when I switched gears from being a scientist in corporate R&D at Dow Chemical Engineering to manufacturing at Intel. So Intel does semiconductor manufacturing and they have a small volume manufacturing plant, uh, which is where I started my journey in the semiconductor industry as the process technology development engineer. I worked there for about two years before I started missing my roots of being a scientist and a chemical engineer and had the opportunity to join BASF in 2018. 
And since 2018, I've continued my journey to be a technical leader with subject matter expertise in advanced function materials and formulation research. 2018, another exciting year for us. Uh, we were blessed with uh, boy-girl twins, uh, thanks to the medical intervention. And uh, I have to say that the reason we are successful as women leaders is not only because of the family we are born in or we get married into, but also the one we create with our partners. And my kids and my partner truly inspire me to be better, right? Uh, I want to make sure that I, I, we're mindful in our actions today so that we leave a sustainable world for them to live in tomorrow. And at the same time, because I have a daughter and a son, I'm teaching my daughter to lead, but I'm also teaching my son how to be led by women. And with that, um, as an innovation manager for BSF's Academic Research Alliance, I am passionate about not only driving transformation of industry by using corporate innovation for sustainability, I'm very much a driver of women empowerment and women leadership, and not just science, technology, engineering, mathematics, but also arts. Um, before we go to the fireside chat, I want to highlight how proud I am to be a part of BSF. Um, we're really proud of our DEI priorities and we incorporate them in our day-to-day -day actions. Our journey uh, for Balance for Better started in 2015 with our goal to achieve 30% leadership by 2030. We started at... Uh, 19.5 in 2015, and I have pushed it all the way up to almost 27% by the end of 2022. And our goal is to hit 30% by 2030, and even more ambitious to be 50% by 2050. Even within that 20%, we have already achieved 30% female managers, and we're working on increasing the number of women experts from 17% to our target. All of this to say is that BSF provides an ecosystem where women can not only thrive, but succeed as well. And we do so by um, several communities, such as women in research, women in engineering, women in business, and women in manufacturing. Uh, for this, we've been recognized um, for second consecutive year by Forbes as best employer for women. We ranked 59th among 400 companies this year. Here you'll see two examples of what it looks like when women make it to the top and truly make their mark on the world. On the left-hand side, you'll see the three awardees uh, that received the two, 2023 Women Make Awards by the Manufacturing Institute, Carol Easley, Cara Masti, and Lindsay Daniels. And you'll see there are different levels of their careers. Lindsay is an emerging leader, uh, Carol is an operations director and Cara is already a VP operations. The second example is where our VP operations care chemicals, Kirsten Four, was inducted in Women's uh, in Manufacturing Hall of Fame in 2013. Now, having given you an ex examples of American ecosystem, I also wanted to emphasize that BSF is a truly global company. We have 110,000 employees globally, or 1.1 lakh employees globally. And that 27% is also reflected in individual regions, whether you take North America, Asia, Europe, or South America and Africa. So this is not a, 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 a misleading number because of one region being more prominent than the other. We maintain that even in Asian and South American region. So with that, um, I'd like to play a one minute video to highlight a very endearing story of women empowerment uh, in India by BSF. It was Project Pragati. It started in 2016 as a partnership between BSF or Kima and um, uh, Jayant Agro in India. As you may all know, India is a leading producer of castor oil. About 80% of the world production happens in India. And with this project, we wanted to empower Indian farmers and predominantly women farmers to be sustainable in their farming of castor oil. So with that, let me...
for us, standing up for women does not just mean taking responsibility for our female voice. We also actively advocate for the women in our supply chains to help them lead self-determined lives. We embrace equity. Together with our partners, we have launched the world's first sustainable castor bean program. The project has the meaningful name Pragati, the Hindi word for progress. It improves working conditions and increases yields through more efficient farming practices. Until now, the visibility of women farmers in Indian agriculture has been quite low, even though they represent the majority of the workforce. <laughs> I mean, our husband expected that today our customers support the government and money. No, he didn't. That is, Kerala ma kam kari ne pan baram pusan ne chokrao ne baram pusan kariye si. To strengthen and empower rural women, the Pragati program aims to engage with more women farmers on decision making, female leadership, financial literacy, and healthcare. We embrace equity. So, Ritika, with that, I'm at the end of my presentation, and um, we can start with the Q and A. But I have to say, I'm truly proud to be a part of BSF, and it makes for a better working day. <clears throat> Thanks, Rohini, and thank you for sharing your journey. Um, I must say very honestly um, that it looked very rosy and all very straightforward. <laughs> and I'm sure that was not the case. And I'm sure you have your set of uh, trials and tribulations that you have dealt with. Um, I would like to begin with something that you said early on, which is your interest in wanting to pursue chemical engineering. And that stemmed from your interest in math. Uh, yes. And this is something that over a period of time uh, in our work at PKC, and interacting with a lot of students at the school, as well as at the undergraduate level, you realize that in general, we don't see a lot of interest amongst women in math. Uh, and we also don't see interest amongst women wanting to pick careers which have associations with math. And mm -hmm. there are numbers to support this. Uh, this is not a perception anymore uh, because there have been studies around this. And there is a lot of effort, uh, I think, nationally today, at least in India, to improve this uh, and to really try and uh, instill, um, uh, you know, whatever it is, whether it is games, whether it is methods and ways by which you can get women interested in various uh, aspects of math. Could you talk a little bit about how you became interested in math? What is this something that had to do with your schooling experience or your higher education experience? Um, <clears throat> I have to say, Priya, my experience and what I try to do for both my kids is it starts very early on. And, and it's, it's as early as kindergarten, right? And you'll see that subconsciously there is this trend of, oh, why do women need to do math or science? But if we break that, it's not that women can't do math and science. So it starts very early on. And it's also about, in general, inculcating that culture of math and science are two streams of education that are absolutely critical, at least up till 10th grade, right? At least up until you have a basic understanding of how this applies and whether you may choose to pursue a career in math or science is a decision that you may want to take when you are about 15 or 18, not at five and not have be that decision taken for you because somebody else thought that you'd be better off doing arts and not science and math. So uh, early on is the only answer I have. And it, it's, I see that, right? Um, it's very natural for my son to say, oh, I'm going to be an astronaut. And my daughter say, I'm going to be an artist. And I'm like, why, why do you think you can be an astronaut, right? And that's, that's a conversation that needs to happen very early on and very often. You can do anything you want. At the same time, you have to also balance it with no pressure to only do engineering, right? That's the other spectrum of what we experience in India as well, is being forced to do something that you're not passionate about. So that, that's, that's a very challenging balance to find. 
Also chemical engineering, I think my understanding is both in India as well as in the US, you don't have a lot of women, uh, you know, wanting or even selecting chemical engineering as a field. We've had women on this forum before uh, from mm -hmm. reputed institutions who are chemical engineers themselves and said, you know, they were probably the first faculty in the late uh, maybe 90s or even early 2000s in a, in a department yeah. full of uh, male chemical engineers, um, you know. Is this something that you observed too in your journey? All all the time. So um, when I, so the reason I got chemical engineering has a nuance there as well, right? So I just like everybody else, I was like, okay, I'm going to go for my counseling and I'm going to pick a big computer science and, and I'm going to make it big. And, and lo and behold, I go for my counseling and, you know, my ranking is not high enough for me to get computer science. And I'm like, okay, well, you know what? I, I know... I don't want to do chemistry and I know I'm not, I don't want to do mechanical and electrical engineering just because it's not like I can't do it. It just, it doesn't click, but I know I like math and I, I'm going to, um, so I had a counselor and I was talking to her and she was like, Oh, have you considered chemical engineering? It seems like you're interested in math. And I go, no, but I don't like chemistry. And she goes, no, no, no chemical engineering is all math. And I was like, okay, well, let's talk. And then she had me talk to the only two women faculty in a in, in the chemical engineering department. And that stat hasn't changed till date. And I've left, left the program. I joined the program 20 years ago and those two teachers are still here. So the numbers are certainly against us, right? In any math dominated field by design, uh, we've created this ecosystem where women don't feel easily inspired to join chemical engineering. Um, and when I say two women faculty, that was, I if I were to give you a percentage, that would be closer to 15 to 18%, right? So that's, that's not a very inspiring number and about the same as women in my chemical engineering batch, right? So out of the class of 32, we were four women. And that's not, a, again, a very inspiring number. And then you go to PhD in the United States and it gets marginally better, still not so, right? So you go from say 15 to 18% to maybe 30, but not necessarily to the 50% that we truly are as a global population. So uh, I think it starts, so this is, this is where I truly believe as an Indian culture, right? Women have always worked. Right. So that's not the issue, whether we've worked from home or we've opened the doors and worked outside. We've always had the power to empower ourselves. What we get with education is not just being literate, but truly educated to empower, to feel empowered, to have a career in whatever field may, we may like. And that's where the conversation needs to begin about what is stopping me from doing science? Is it a confidence gap or is it truly that I'm not interested in it or I haven't received the opportunities where I might learn enough to feel like I'm good at it and that can and that is very easy to happen right it starts with oh yeah let, you know it's a very subtle unconscious bias that starts with oh yeah you should do more art or, or you know you should maybe do more home science or maybe chemistry or biology might be a better suited field for women you know, it's okay if you're not good at math. But how about we change that to say, you know, it's it's okay, you're not good at it. Let's work on it together. And let's see if you can find your rhythm. And that's, and that takes work, that takes work. And it's, it's truly a village, right? So not just parents, but teachers, the community, everyone, it's about a conversation that says, yes, it's okay. It's, it's really okay for women to put in that extra effort and learn math and science. Why not? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, sort of leading on to that, you decided to do research uh, yeah. when after engineering, um, maybe at the time you graduated, uh, maybe the norm was that a lot of people uh, maybe look for jobs and you decided to continue or pursue research uh, after being an engineer. So that is what drove you to do research or your interest in research and at that point not wanting to maybe work for a company? Um, good question. So, uh, I mean, it's easier for me to say my mom was a PhD and, you know, that was like a no brainer. Right. And, and as I was doing my undergraduate degree, I truly realized that if you want to be heard, 
let's start by empowering ourselves with all the tools. And one of the tools, a very simple one, and it sounds simple, it's very hard, whether it's financially or time or circumstantial, is education. And I want to be as highly educated in the field that I wanted to pursue so that that's not a limiting step for me. I never wanted to be in a room and hear, oh, by the way, you're not PhD, right? So that was a very short-sighted motivation for me. But what it led me to do was to do a, a research project at ISC Bangalore. And, and that was truly an eye-opener, right? Going from four walls of an engineering school to ISC Bangalore, where you know it's about conversations and science and innovation and true inspiration. And that's where I was like, okay, well, chemical engineering is... Is I'm excited about it, but I'm truly inspired by nanoscience, right? What happens to the chemistry and physics of these interfaces as you shrink the size of things? And that was, uh, that was for me exciting enough to say, you know what, I don't need to no, don't need to grow up quite yet, right? That was that was another motivation. There's a slight bit there. And what worked a little bit was because of the stipend situation in the United States, it was easier to not feel like I was depending on my parents while I did my higher education, which I think you've experienced the same way, right? Even that little bit of stipend uh, by doing TA ship, by doing RA ship, you can, you can, you can earn your keep and still um, delay that decision of joining the workforce just because you are forced by financial circumstances. So it, it was it was easy and not easy. I can imagine it be not easy if you are if you don't have the right ecosystem. And I think what worked in my household was from very early on. So I am I was never trained to in household things ever, right? That was a thing in our uh, home that you know uh, you're not gonna go in the kitchen, right? So education, that's all that matters, right? Do whatever you want. Kitchen is not a place to be, right? So there was this very subtle thing that, you know, boys, girls, same rules. He gets pocket money, you get pocket money. He doesn't go in kitchen. You don't, even, or he wants to go in kitchen and he can go and you don't want to go in the kitchen and that's fine. Absolutely, right? My brother is a much better cook than I ever will be and has been since he was like 12 years old. So that freedom to be empowered to do what we wanted to do made that decision easy but I can imagine it is not easy. Yeah, thank you for saying that. I think it's the small things that matter or make a difference at the end of the day. Um, my next question is not so much about um, the uh, your, your education or uh, the technical aspects of your education, but the experience in your 20s to mm -hmm. leave home and move far away from home to live in a country where um, you largely do everything for yourself by yourself, uh, mm. coming from a country where a lot of things are done for you. And you're also in a very competitive school, a very competitive program where you need to perform. Uh, and you're pretty much on your own in that sense for the first time in your life, in your 20s. And the reason I ask you to share this experience is because a lot of the girls that are part of the program that we run are here on this forum today. And we've had discussions with them about leaving their homes, which could be mm -hmm. small towns um, or even cities to go and even do an internship, maybe in a bigger city or to spend two or three months to do a project somewhere. And there is a lot of um, fear, hesitation, mm -hmm. apprehension, uh, whether they will be able to do this on their own. And I think one aspect of it is, of course, the work that you need to do to get your project done. But the other aspect is, will you actually be able to do this alone? Will you be able to manage a house? And I, I when I say manage a house, I'm not even talking family, kids, husband, none of that. And no. I, it's just yourself, maybe your finances, maybe just the just living alone and living alone in India is a very different experience than living alone in the U S because in the U S you're literally doing everything by yourself. So oh. could you talk a little bit about that move and that experience for you? So maybe a precursor to that. So baby steps, right? So um, after second year, I did an internship in Mumbai uh, at BARC and my dad goes, Oh, I have a friend in uh, who lives in um, Bandra. 
and you know Bandra. So he goes, oh yeah, you can live with him. So I go, I spend time. Uh, I think about almost two months with family. Um, they're they're almost like my uncles, right? So he's very close friend. Like the grandmother was making lunches for me, and I would just pick up my lunch and go and happily work and everything was done for me and so third year rolls around and this time I'm like okay I'm gonna go a little bit further right I mean I'm gonna find a town where my dad doesn't have a friend right does it should not give him a reason to do the same thing again so I went to Bangalore and he goes oh I'm gonna go drop you off and and he comes to drop me off and he actually met with my advisor and he goes oh she's gonna be working with you and my advisor looked at my dad and he goes Okay, so why are you here? And that was it, right? My dad goes, okay, you're on your own. Um, and, and what helps is, I think, for me, it started with IC Bangalore having lab mates who were truly supportive, right? Um, it was okay to work nights, right? It was safe to work nights should I need it to. We were all sharing the same computer. So the PhD student had the prime priority they would work when they can, then the master's student. And if you're an intern, you work whatever hours you can. And being on a very safe campus, I that was the baby step. That was the training, right? It's okay to be on your own. And the, the beauty of the second internship was that I actually got paid, right? So I could manage and figure out if I wanted to have fun, whether it was watching a movie or eating out, how could I manage my money? So that was a little bit of a precursor, right? Can I be two months without asking my parents for extra money? Not that they didn't give any money, but that was a little bit of a training. And so when it came to coming to the United States, I think the biggest difference, as you pointed out, was going from a hostel environment or a home environment where everything is done for you and all you have to do is work or focus on your studies or education or whatever it is that you're doing to doing everything, right? I go there, the, the, if you don't cook, uh, you have to eat out, right? There is no other option. You either kick or you eat out. And after a month of eating out, I'm like, okay, that's enough of Subways and Chipotles. And there's only that much I can eat KFC back in the day. Um, and okay, I'm going to make Kittery, right? I mean, that's the simplest thing, right? Everybody eats it. Everybody makes it. I, I blew the safety on the cooker. There goes safety. So learning, right? And and it helped to have a student community, which I'm sure you had at your school as well. And it was it was like a, a village. It's a family away from home where it's a safe enough environment for you to make mistakes. I remember I didn't have enough money to buy my own laptop. And I was like, okay, I'm not going to ask my dad. I asked my friend and repaid that loan over the next three months, right? So uh, I think having that confidence that you can and feel that you are empowered to do it, I think goes a, a, a bit of a long way. But it's easier to say now. I'm sure I was very scared back in the day, right? I went to Baltimore. You, uh, <laughs> I distinctly remember, right? It was good that I didn't see news before I, I accepted the offer and my parents uh, still didn't watch uh, Baltimore news and I land at BWI airport and two people from Raj uh, Rajasthan, there were only two people at Hopkins from Rajasthan and they were my host. They come to pick me up. They pick me up at 4 p.m. We are home. They're feeding me tea and they go, hey, Rohini, by the way, make sure you always carry $10 in your wallet because if you get mugged and you don't have any money, they'll kill you because you wasted your time. And I was like, where have I landed, right? Um, so going from that to slowly learning to be independent on the campus, working hours that were not all day, right? You have to work sometimes now. It's, it takes courage. It's hard. Uh, you have to build that community. You have to surround yourself with like-minded people, women, men who empower women and push women and bolster women to be better. So Thank you for that. And I think it'll be nice if you can add a little bit about what that kind of global exposure does to your self-confidence, does to also how you view the world uh, at such a young age. And uh, I'm not saying it's mandatory for everyone to get it, but I'm just, it, because you have it, I think it would be nice uh, if you can share what that kind of exposure uh, means to you. And what do you think it means to people who are young, who actually are able to get that kind of exposure? I think it's scary, but 
until you do it, you will never figure out that you can actually do it, right? And that's the catch right there. You have to test a little bit. You have to be um, a little bit brave every day, right? So the saying goes, you have to do one brave act every day. And I think that's a part of where you train your mind and your body to be better. And having the international exposure sort of throws you at the deep end and you have to figure out how to sink or swim, right? And and that that is the push, right? If you never leave the comfort of home, you never be challenged enough to figure out what you're truly made of. So you have to challenge yourself every day. And it can be simply as small as going around uh, in your community, right? Um, I distinctly remember the time where it was a proud moment for us to be able to go to the grocer and get sugar. It didn't matter, right? It was the ability at age eight or 10 to walk half a kilometer to a grocer by yourself and get what you wanted and not be cheated, right? Um, that, that training, and you take that and you amplify it a million times when you go to a completely different culture. And that's a big piece of it, right? Here in India, we're a village. We know our neighbors. They know us. They can read our faces and say, hey, you're doing okay. Can I help you? That's not a thing that comes at e easy in the United States. That's a big cultural change. And you have to figure out how what you're truly made of, right? And, and, and each challenge that you face makes you stronger. But equally true is that you have to lean in and ask for help if you need it, right? So not saying brave meaning, knowing the answers. I don't think I, there were so many things I didn't know. Like the first time I filled my tax forms, I was like, whoa, that's ugh. never done it. How do I do it? And, and it's, it's not easy to get that information, even though internet is, is our hands. What are we truly looking for? Am I looking at the right thing? And what sort of bank accounts do I need? Like, what's the difference between a checking and a saving? I, I mean, I didn't know. Like, do I invest in a CD or do I, I don't know. Do I invest in the stock market? And in slowly and steadily, because you're forced to make these decisions for yourself, you learn how to survive. And you learn how to build that sixth sense about what's right and wrong. You start trusting your intuition a little bit because the more experience you have, whether it's positive or negative, trains you for future. So um, yeah, I think it's very important. And not that it only happens if you go to a different country, but exposure is very important. Like baby steps, take a step away from your home, away from your city. Uh, state right uh, it, at, at the end I think the sooner we start this the earlier we started the better it is right because you even as parents we tell our kids so we want you to be independent people down the line but if I don't train you right how can I expect you to survive when I'm not around so yeah absolutely um, you finish your PhD and you go to work in an industry setting, uh, was that work largely again research driven, or was it yes. more commercial? No, it was it was it was R and D. So I was part of what's called a corporate research segment um, at any company. So you have corporate research at the center of it, and you have business units all around. And all the folks in the corporate R and D have broad experience where they can engage with multiple business unit to address their challenges, and then each of these business units have their own customer segments. So I wasn't making the product myself in a plant, but I was doing research that was enabling our production and our innovation pipeline down the, down the line, whether it was addressing some of the short-term challenges that they may be experiencing with the performance of a product that we have, or a challenge with the production line or, or something blue sky research making completely new products that may find value uh, say 10 years down the line. So that's where I started. And I think my, my it's not like I knew I wanted to go to industry. Like there was this uh, a long period of confusion where I'm like, okay, maybe you know I wanna go to academia. I wanna get to industry. Amidst all of that was the uncertainty around immigration and going to do a postdoc was like getting a two year 
extension on that decision, right? So uh, I used that two years to truly figure out if I wanted to go to academia or industry, or if I wanted to go to industry, what kind of work I wanted to do. And one of the things that helped me was the project I did for my postdoc was funded by an industry, right? So it was my direct visibility to how industry thinks and how we in academia were thinking about the same exact problem. And to me, what was exciting was that industry experience or industry is, a, is about a business perspective of science, right? So it's not like it's devoid of science. It's about the business perspective of science. How do you go from in, an idea to an innovation to impact, right? And for me, that was truly exciting. And that was my very clear segment to, I know I want to go to industry and I do want to go to core R&D. And I switched that a little bit when I went to Intel. So kind of going on the extreme outside, very much in manufacturing and production, um, and then going a step in. So this was a part of my zigzaggy trajectory, right? It wasn't perfect. It isn't perfect. It, it's not like it wasn't, it isn't perfect. And a part of it was, life decisions that we made as a unit um, where I needed to take a detour here and there. And I went to manufacturing, then coming back inside to BSF. Um, at BSF, I was part of a business unit and the business unit was semiconductor applications catering to in companies like Intel as our customers, right? So a step in. And then um, four years later, now I'm back to corporate R&D where I drive innovation pipeline. So um, kind of all over the place. And, and I know that this is my happy place. Um, and I, I, am, I like where I am finally here after. Um, I think also because years. we have a lot of students, college students on this uh, forum, um, mm -hmm. just to sort of simplify the jargon, I would like you to, with an example, uh, tell us what, what is an industry funded PhD? What is corporate okay. R and D, and what is a business uh -huh. unit? Oof. Ah, uh, yes. Sorry. I um, yes. I should explain. So um, okay. So after your undergrad, should you go to a university and join a PhD program? You're supposed to publish a thesis. You have to say, "This is my new idea. This is my hypothesis, and I did all of these experiments to validate or negate this hypothesis. These are my conclusions." Right. That's a thesis. And whether there are there to do the thesis, you need funding, uh, whether it is funding for your stipend or funding for the actual research you're doing, the supplies you need. And in most situations, your a PhD advisor who is a professor has had some funding. And that funding source can either be a public funding, uh, like DSC, Department of Science and Technology, has these calls where they would say, okay, these are broad topics, nanoscience, battery recycling, polymer recycling. They give you a, a chunk of money to do blue sky research that goes to your professor, and you can use that to be a little bit more free in your approach, in your thesis. The second way of getting funding is where an industry can approach a professor and say, this is where uh, we need your expertise. This is our gap and we'll give you uh, a money money through what is called a sponsored research agreement and for you to conduct that research. And that research can be conducted by undergraduate student or, uh, or graduate student or postgraduate students. And that is an industry funded research project that may either lead to a PhD or you can do it as a postdoc. Um, can you, so one was business unit, one was a research, what was the third piece to your question? So there was corporate R&D, industry funded PhD and business unit. Okay, so industry funded PhD I've answered. Uh, corporate R&D. So any uh, company uh, that is rooted in innovation has a central unit um, that is called corporate research and development, which means they, their mandate is to make sure that the company is, has the competitive advantage. So say if it's a chemical company, they would want to make sure that they fill their innovation pipeline with new products, processes, um, and, and, and production ideas uh, to stay competitive, whether it is expanding their customer base or making their products more sustainable or uh, making sure their products are more um, 
financially uh, exciting for the customers. So um, that's a central unit um, within any company. Uh, so that's either core R&D or corporate R&D. Uh, now, because you have a business enterprise, which in cases in chemical industry, you have certain uh, chemicals that you make, for example, and that portfolio can be segmented, right? So you can say, I have coatings and I have catalysis and I have, uh, say, for example, um, dispersions and raisins. And, and each of those segments may have multiple individual businesses or business units because they cater to a specific business segment within the entire chemical industry. And that could be providing coatings for an automotive industry, right? So now you go from corporate focus on coatings to a segment of coatings to coatings for automotive industry. And you get to business unit that's working directly with the automotive uh, manufacturers to provide any coating solutions that they need. So that's the, the, the circle. So you have the corporate R&D, you have the, um, uh, the, the, the business segments, business units and customers, or you can do it flip and you have the customer at the heart, you have the business uh, units, the business segment and corporate R&D. Thank you for that. Um, and uh, third one was? I think, yeah, I think you covered all three. Okay. Perfect. Yeah, all, all good. Thank you. Uh, I was just making sure that everyone understood what these meant because these are important terms. They are used in many contexts. And I think it's important that they know what these mean uh, so Absolutely. that they know that these opportunities exist. Um, before I open the forum up to the audience, my last question is, to you is about something you said about teaching women to lead. Uh, mm -hmm. I think there is a lot of conversations that we have about women being part of the workforce, participating in the mm -hmm. workforce, uh, in fact, even staying in the workforce. But mm -hmm. um, the more difficult conversations are about uh, mentoring or teaching women uh, to lead. Is this something that you believe that can be taught? Is this something that uh, you believe is taught at a certain stage of your career? Uh, or is this something that you believe is um, something that you acquire organically over a period of time if you are doing something career-wise long enough in a certain space because this is always an enigma uh, in mm -hmm. some sense I think if you ask people who teach in business schools they'll tell you it's not an enigma it can be taught however in the science space um, I don't think we have a lot of forums where there is formal uh, teaching in some way for women uh, you know to become leaders or even to aspire to become leaders so it's sort of this sort of you know blanks white space that nobody knows what goes on till you actually get in and then mm -hmm. you sort of learn or you as you said you sort of learn to swim or keep afloat so could you talk a little bit about that Yes. Um, how? How? Let me let me preface by this. If <laughs> if you ask a man, they're all born leaders, right? Even if they're not, they're all leaders. But if you ask a woman, even though they are leaders and they are leading, they don't realize they're leaders, right? That goes back to the confidence gap. Right. And to bridge that confidence gap, we're past that window where organic learning would work. Right. We had that window. We tried it. It worked for some. It didn't work for most. I think it's time to say, let's be more purposeful in our conversation about how we empower women to lead. And that's about not just um, the opportunity, but how to tap into that opportunity do you feel the confidence that you can do it, right? And that's where teaching, I think, is, is going to help bridge that gap, right? So organic work for a little bit, now it's time for teaching. And um, if you listen to, um, I think her name is Alexis from Colorado State University, she talks about science of leadership. That's what she calls science of leadership. And one of the things that she talks about is, how fear triggers a flight of fight or flight response. And the fear is not just from a physical danger, it's also from a psychological danger. So when we imagine a situation where women get into an unprecedented situation or a, a, a situation where they know there is a bias, right? And they, they know they've 
you know, they have to be a little bit careful. It triggers that fear response, right? And that kind of diminishes your uh, your overall sense of self and you're driven by just pure fear. So who's to say we can't train our brain to be better? How to be not fearful? How to raise our hand and ask the question and speak up? Um, I was an introverted for the longest time and I I had I I had no voice I think I distinctly remember it was a, a Hindi debate right where I'm like okay well you know this is I think ninth standard I'm like this is it right if I don't do it now right I'm gonna miss that opportunity so I signed up I was shaking the entire time but I did it right so there is a way for us to train ourselves and our minds to overcome that fear. And the third and the most important thing that you talked about, right? How making sure we don't lose our women, right? And that could be uh, because you think you need to start a family because you are getting married or you have a kid too. I think it's about staying at the table, right? Not leaving, not mentally checking out, not physically checking out. And it's not easy and it doesn't happen without a supportive family. But that's, I think it's all important, organic, early on, structured education at the right time, which I would certainly say is in the formative years between nine standard, when you are starting to decide your, your um, uh, what do you call the focus or the major for your 11, 10, 12 standard, your undergraduate degree, these are the formative years. And that's where education is very, the forceful conversation about how we can train women to be more confident, I think, is a key piece to it. And then making sure they have the ecosystem to feel like they can stay, they can hang around. And, and it's not easy, right? I think I was, after having kids, there was a good period of a year where I was, I think, in a haze, right? It took me a good year and a half to find my fire back. And, and that's where uh, my partner was, no, just hang in there. It's okay, hang in there. And it's sharing the load, right? Um, which I think ha this is the beauty of the generation, right? Which happens all the time. It's more of a norm now than exception, but you can do it. You cannot do it without it, right? The first time I left for a business travel, uh, I distinctly remember the conversation was not that, oh, mommy is going. It's more like, hey, mommy is going for work. Say bye-bye right there was no crying no no guilt trips uh, but that's it's it's you have to be purposeful about it right and and that happens from within from outside going back to family you're born in family you get married to and the family that you build yourself right you need all three all right so my last last question promise and we, we do this with all the women who speak <laughs> on this forum which is what does a day in your life look like typically Oof. Uh, boring for the most part. I get up at five, uh, do a few things around the house. I get an hour of yoga in before the chaos begins. Kids get up and both my partner and I, we scramble to get the kids out the door. Um, my work starts a little bit sooner than my husband. So I'll typically start my meetings at 7.30 in my year while kids are still kind of getting ready. Um, and then it's all work um, up until say evening where I then take a break, uh, dinner time, preparation for kids, kids come home, uh, then kids go to sleep. And there's part two of the job that starts, which is all of the creative thinking um, and global team meeting. So as I said, pretty boring. All right. Thank you. Um, <laughs> the first question, I think this has been sent to me on chat to ask you, which is I'm a final year student in graduation, and I would like to know if okay. I could follow your footsteps. Uh, how did you start with a PhD immediately after your graduation? Um, okay, so you're already final year? Yes. Undergrad? Yes. Okay, okay. Um, so I think if you were to start a PhD in United States, they expect you to have 10 plus 2 plus 4, right? So 10 standard plus 2 years, 11, 12 plus 4 years, meaning 4 years of undergrad. So if you are an undergraduate in uh, chemistry or biology where you only have 3 years, I would encourage you to do a master's first so that you become eligible for PhD. 
regarding information, I think I would I would recommend starting by uh, learning about the uh, eligibility criteria for the programs you're interested in and the requirements. So what sort of scores do you need? There are typically two scores required. One is English proficiency. Um, and the second one is GRE, where they have both English and math proficiency. So those are the two basic scores that are needed. Um, other than that, of course, there is for you to figure out what's your field of interest. So that's entirely upon you. Do you want to pursue chemistry, chemical engineering, material science, interface, hotspots in the middle of it? All of these are possible. So uh, my recommendation would be figuring out what is your interest of topic of interest. And uh, if you want to go to United States, what are the requirements? If you want to go to UK, they have completely different requirements. If you want to go to Europe, they have completely different requirements. But I would start doing by doing research about topics of interest and where you want to go. Our next question is, um, is it good to go for a PhD after master's in computer engineering or directly go into industry for an R&D career? Uh, computer science, I would say, is a field where both can be equally successful, right? Because uh, you'll see um, that in computer science might be the only field where it's you learn on the job as much as you would learn in a PhD. There's a little bit of background noise. So at that point, I would recommend looking at what your interests are. Uh, some PhDs in some parts of the world are only three years. So maybe if that's something you'd like to do, then you can think about doing that. But computer science, as I said, might be the only exception where you can learn on the job and still progress into an R&D role within a computer science firm. Uh, we have a question from Sushama. Uh, and in the spirit of raising your hands and asking a question, I request Sushama to unmute herself, if possible, switch on her video. Uh, briefly introduce herself, tell us where she's joining us from today and ask her question. Sushama? Are you able to unmute yourself? I hope so. Um, all right, her question is, are you aware of PhD exchange programs? Uh, I would say, uh, do you mean where you join a program in India and then you get to spend some time abroad? Yes. I think IITB Monash would be one that comes to mind right away. Um, I know IGSTC offers some opportunities for you to get spend time with industry in Germany during your PhD. I know this because we as BSF, being a German company, we host uh, certain PhD students. But that would be my two uh, recommendations. Thank you for your response. Is that, did that help? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay. I would request, if you have a question, please raise your hand and we will ask you to unmute and you can ask your question. I think Dr. Sankita, she wants to ask something. Dr. Sangeeta Saxena, I guess. She was trying to unmute. Dr. Saxena, would you like to unmute and ask your question? All right, I think while she, um, I, I, I don't hear a response from her, but there is a question on the chat box, which says, what's the criteria for applying for a PhD program abroad? I'm assuming what they mean is also getting into a PhD program abroad and not just applying. 
Yes, yes. Um, okay, so having done it for United States, uh, let me uh, give you the criteria for United States because I don't want to get it wrong for other countries. Uh, a typical application for PhD requires you to demonstrate past experience with research a little bit, which is where having some in the internship experience, whether you work with a professor or at an industry would be really helpful. Um, they also require you to have letters of support, typically three, and having these letters of support from your advisors away from your educational institute is usually helpful. So, for example, if you're doing a four-year engineering program, I would advise you to do an internship after your second year then an internship after your third year. So those are your two recommendations. And hopefully out of these two uh, internships, you have some experience of doing research or at least problem solving that you can then use to build upon your statement of purpose. And the third recommendation of course should be from your educational institute. So three letters of recommendation minimum, a statement of purpose, uh, GRE and TOEFL score, those are the two scores you would need. One is for English proficiency, GRE is for English and math proficiency. And you will need, of course, all of your transcripts to show that you are pursuing your education from an accredited institution and that you are uh, eligible for graduation. Because say you are in a four-year program, you would apply somewhere in the middle of your fourth year so that you can start without a gap after finishing your fourth year uh, directly in the fall. So. Thank you. Good yeah. resume. Good resume. <laughs> you, you want to you want a, a, a resume that's easy to read, I think. Our next question is, uh, is there a short term course in the US in nanomedicine that you can recommend? Ooh, uh, on top of my head, I would, sorry. I think that question was by Dr. Nadia. I think she wants to ask it directly. Ah, okay, Dr. Rabia, please go ahead. Uh, she's muted now. Yeah. But would you like to take the question? Um, yes. Um, uh, on top of my head, I couldn't tell you, but I know you could start with LinkedIn Learnings. I think LinkedIn has done a beautiful job of collating um, these learnings that are like prequel courses that would then give you uh, um, a, a headway into a more in-depth course. You could also try something called Coursera. MIT eLearnings is another great portal where you could start with. And uh, most of the time, LinkedIn Learnings and MIT courses are free. Coursera may have a small fee. So those are the three uh, portals for information where I would start. Uh, next question is, I'm a final year student. In which subject can we complete our M pharmacy in India. Um, I'm assuming what is this? What the question means? What is the scope for people for students graduating with an M farm in India? A scope in India or scope of going from M farm in India to elsewhere? I think it means in India. I think is there COVID is approved. The only industry making money is pharma. So I think the question is a, a tremendous number of opportunities. If you're far, if you're graduating from in a in a field where you have experience in, that would help you get into the pharmaceutical industry. And if you look at, I was looking at the numbers the other day. It's 130, the target from the uh, Department of Biotechnology. India's Department of Biotechnology has a target to do like 130 million or something like that. It's a huge industry, huge potential. And um, we've made a mark for ourselves by making our own vaccine, by making our own testing kits, right? We've, we've truly made a mark as a pharmaceutical country. So I think the prospects are very, very good. Our next question is, um... When do you start planning your career? School, bachelor's, master's? And when does it begin to start showing direction? 
uh, career is there is no ending or start right so uh, imagine if i were to tell you if you took commerce in 11th and 12th and now you want to go back and do science you're going to have to go back in time right so the answer is sooner the better and uh, the misnomer we have is we only have a career uh, if we make it there when we're 22, right? So uh, career is an ever evolving process, right? You can have a career even at age 60 and post-retirement. Uh, and and it, it truly is about as an individual to be on this path, to this, this journey is more important, right? So as long as you're moving a step closer in that direction, it should look like, you know, a rough picture. Now, do you know at age 10 that you want to be, I don't know, a scientist? I don't know. Uh, my kids' preference changes every day, right? But it's that passion of, you know, I want to do something. That's important, right? And you may figure out, you know, after doing a biology class in 10 standard, you know what, I, I'm i just not good at it. And, and, you take the information that you gather at each stage and inform your decision, but you're moving in the right direction as long as you know that you're purposeful in your actions, not just kind of waiting for it to happen. Because if you wait for it to happen, then it will not happen. So you have to be mindful. You have to be purposeful. And it's okay to make mistakes, right? It's okay to go three steps forward and two steps backwards. And that's fine. Or maybe a step forward and three steps backwards. As long as you know and you take that learning, incorporate it and be better about it in the next decision that you make. Um, I request Jessica to unmute herself and ask her question. Hi, Jessica. Hello, ma'am. I'm Jessica from Mumbai. Uh, I would like to know, as I'm pursuing my bachelor's degree in biochemistry honors, um, what is the scope in, like, I want to do a uh, apl application of biochemistry. Mm -hmm. So I want to switch to biotechnology. But some are saying to do a master's in biochemistry itself and then get into research. What is your suggestion? Uh, again, there is, um, so <laughs> I hope the people who told you you need to do masters, uh, are your teachers and, and you know, who know more about the biochemistry field, but I think, uh, for it's, it's what you think is best, right? So if you think at this stage, maybe you want to take a break from education and go into a working environment and see what it feels like try it and then go back to masters you're absolutely empowered to it's your decision it's your career it's your life right uh, are your financial circumstances where you need to maybe start earning sooner than later that's a factor or maybe uh, you have some uh, familial commitments right so one or the other right it really depends on you at this stage uh, if you are I think going to biotech industry, if you realize after interviewing that maybe you are missing some industry specific training or skill set, you should feel empowered to acquire that training with or without that master's program, right? And it is not easy. None of this is easy. Whether you have to self-educate by taking a course, a certification course to bridge that gap, that's one way of doing it, or you can formally do a master's and then do it. And all of these combinations are available to you. Does that help, Jessica? Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. We have a question from uh, Ashwini Lili. Her question is, working in the corporate space in the US look, or anywhere else requires a lot of self-promotion. Um, how, how do you deal with that? And how oh, do you it's learning. It's learning, right? So uh, this is the, the part of the cultural shock that I mentioned, right? So in India, we are told that like, do good work and the work will speak for you or the work will speak for itself. Unfortunately, it doesn't, right? So not only do you have to do the work, you have to talk about what you've done and you have to keep talking about what you've done again and again and again. And I think, I, I don't think it is wrong, 
right? Because it's naive to assume that somebody else will come and drive your career for you, right? It's your career. You have to be in the driving state. Uh, think of it simply. Are you playing a game of Ludo or chess, right? Depending on the game you're playing, you have to abide by the rules, right? So if the game requires you to not just do the work, but talk about it, I think to be truly in the driver's seat, you do have to talk about it. Now, uh, whether it's good or not, whether it's the right thing to do or not, that's a whole different debate. But I agree in industry. And I think that's changing. So maybe if I may expand there, it's changing for even academia too, right? Uh, imagine how many professors are on Twitter today, actively promoting each article that comes out of their lab. So it's, it's I think, everywhere. It's across industry and academia, both, where it's imperative for you to make sure that your work is noticed. Um, there's a question from Priyanka. Uh, okay. Ma'am, what is your biggest motivation through your journey? Uh, first of all, um, by the way, ma'am is so hard to hear, right? So if you can dial it down to Rohini, that would be great. Um, and sorry, if you may repeat that question, what was Without ma'am, what is your biggest motivation through your journey? Ooh, um, my biggest motivation is I should never have regrets that I didn't try. I think it's, it's, uh, it's, it's okay to fail. I just don't want to feel like I didn't even figure out whether I would fail or succeed because I didn't try or I didn't give it my best. That has been the sole motivator. Every time I'm scared, it's, 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 oh, well, personally too, my husband took me our, our first your at first anniversary, he took me skydiving and I go, do you really know me? And he goes, well, if you don't try it, you're going to regret it. So yes, it's, it's scary. It always is. But if you don't try, you're going to never figure out if you're good at it or not. So that's my motivator. Any more questions? Do you have a question, Rajeshri? No, ma'am. I have a question. Yes, please. Please introduce yourself. Yes, ma'am. My name is Pratiksha Tatatre Harge. I am from Nashik. Hi, Pratiksha. Uh, hello, ma'am. Ma'am, I have a question that uh, have you have any idea about the pharmacy related jobs in the Dubai? Uh, unfortunately, I, uh, I do not know uh, about any specific uh, region uh, in, in specific uh, areas because I've never been to Dubai. Um, but I would start with LinkedIn. Usually it's a good place for you to start at any available openings and see what the requirements are for that job. Okay, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Of course. Uh, ma'am, I have also one question. Uh, who is your biggest inspiration in your life? Uh, mom, I think hands down. Uh, I think till date, it's... Uh, it, it, to me, it feels like she's a superwoman, right? So uh, my dad was in military engineering services, posted elsewhere all the time. We were three kids and we were handful, two girls and a boy uh, in, in Jaipur. She is professor of organic chemistry, handling three handful of kids, having a job, having a career, managing a home, all three of us. And we are three very different kids. So I'm a chemical engineer by training. My sister is a fashion designer and my brother is MBA finance. So, I, and we did not make it easy for her. But I think the messaging from day one is you have to be better every day, right? And, and she did it um, in the truest sense of leading by example. We saw her do it every day. She still, still does it. When I had my kids, the first phone call was, Mommy, I need help, right? So. Okay, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Of course. 
Priya, you're on mute. Sorry, I meant to ask if anybody had any more questions. I think we've asked all the questions that I've got, at least on chat. Um, and if we don't, then I would request everyone to switch on your cameras, at least those who can. We want a quick group photo. Ideally, we would have liked to do this session in person uh, with Rohini, uh, but um, I think we're making the best of the fact that we're able to do this with her today. Um, so please switch on your cameras for a quick... And group. while everybody is doing that, I, I really want to say a couple of things, right? We are only limited by our imagination and our courage to act and not just... Uh, courage, uh, meaning also we have to match our convictions with the courage to follow through. And, and the only advice that I would give any young woman is be brave, be bold. Let's break barriers together, right? We can't do it alone. So with that, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak. Thanks, Rohini. I think uh, I would have asked you to do closing remarks, but thank you very much for doing it. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you very much for also joining us uh, when it's, uh, I think, very, very early in the morning for you uh, in the US. Um, I think uh, we would like to host you the next time you're in Pune, uh, also get you to interact with some of the grantees of the Vigyan program. Uh, I think they would love to meet you. Person. A lot of them are joining us online from different parts of Maharashtra today. Uh, I'm sure they would like to meet you here when you're here next time. So Absolutely. It's truly a invitation. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. It's a privilege and an honor to be here. And I'm happy to any uh, answer any questions via email. And I look forward to meeting all of you in person when I visit next. Great. Let us know if you want to connect with Rohini. We'll be happy to make those introductions. Um, if you have any questions for her, we'll be very, very happy to sort of enable those uh, conversations with Rohini. Uh, with that, I think if we can get a quick group picture, Gayatri. We are done. We're done. All right. Thank you very much, Rohini. And I hope you have a very good morning. I hope you get some sleep to make up for the sleep that you've lost. <laughs> no, it's 5 a.m. It's time to begin my usual boring day. But I want to thank every one of you. Namaste. Thank you very much. And thank you very much to all of you for joining us today. Have a good day. Bye. Uh, Bye. So, uh, participants, we have shared a feedback form uh, link in the chat box. Uh, please submit uh, it by today. So uh, we can send a certificate to the participant by Monday. Yep. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Yeah.